I'm Andrew Harvey, and I'm here with one of my favorite people and with someone who constantly and profoundly teaches me and someone whom I believe to be one of the few really great teachers of radical embodiment on the planet. I'm with Philip Shepard, and we're going to plunge into a conversation that celebrates his work. If you haven't met Philip Shepard's work yet, you are truly missing something absolutely essential for our evolution as a species. His first book, New Self, New World, is by now recognized by all of us as a great spiritual classic. And his second book, Radical Wholeness, takes all the revelations of the first to another level. So go out and buy them and dive into them and let Philip's amazing vision urge you into a more and more profound and embodied presence so that you can go out into the world and do the great work that is called for now, the work of embodied love in action. But before I ask Philip any of the questions that I'm pregnant with, I want you to hear his voice. And this particular passage comes from a as yet unpublished interview. The interviewer asks you, I heard you say at the workshop, presence isn't something that can be achieved. It's not a static image. That challenged me a bit because I think I've endeavored to find presence as though when I get it, it's some sort of quality that I then have. You're asking to think of it differently. And this is Philip's reply, and I invite you to listen to this reply, not just because it is profoundly wise, but also because it's expressed with an exquisite tenderness and precision that itself is a lesson in embodied presence. One of the things that I admire beyond telling in Philip's writing is that his writing itself is an emanation of his grounded, radiant presence. So please listen. Our sense of independence encourages us to believe that presence can be achieved and possessed. We think of wholeness in the same way, be whole in body, mind and spirit, as the saying goes. We believe that self-knowledge is something we achieve as we reach deep down inside ourselves and discover our truth there. None of that seems tenable to me. We discover who we are by coming into felt relationship with the world around us. You can come into felt relationship with a leaf drifting from a tree, with a child playing with a chalk on the sidewalk, with a strain of music. As you come into felt relationship with each of those, who you are is illuminated in a particular way. The more deeply you come into felt relationship with the world, the more deeply you discover who you are, not as a fixed, known entity, but as a responsive presence illuminated by the world. As a responsive presence illuminated by the world. You don't get better than that. That's as far as language can go to describe the enormously beautiful experience of becoming one with the one in wholeness. Knowing something about your life as I do as your friend, I know that you began in real anguish and rage in your early teens. So can you just tell us how this great journey started to unfold? and from where it unfolded. I lived in a rage for years. 
And the source of that rage, I mean, there was a familial source, um, which really goes back to my father, who, you know, God bless him. He, you know, as a young man, he was taken by the army and, and learned what it means to be a man within that system. Right. And, and I think the 50s in general, the conformity of the 50s, was shaped by a generation of fathers who had been impacted and imprinted by, by the army. And he, you know, father knows best his, his assertion of his will over my life um, mm -hmm. was, was taken for granted by him. It was an entitlement um, that he didn't question. And I rankled against that. And then um, he, was, uh, he was deeply unfaithful to my mom. And of course, blamed her for his transgressions. <laughs> if she were more beautiful, if she were, and, and, and at the beginning she didn't know what was going on because she didn't know about, about the affair. Um, and I sort of came between them and, you know, there was a moment where I'd um, intervened in his um, punishment. He loved humiliation and he was, he was humiliating my younger brother. I came in and, and I put an end to that. And he, he said, who, you know, who closed the door? Um, basically. And I said, I did. And he moved right up to oh me, God. um, and expecting me to back down. And I didn't. And with all my heart, I was saying, please give me a shove. Please just give me the excuse to lash out. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, he was wise enough not to. So there was that context. So at a very early age, the patriarchy um, was felt as a, as a rank injustice. And there was something else, though, that was a much, much larger thing related to that. But I... I felt my freedom compromised by the very values and language and customs and ways of seeing that my culture had seeded into my body. And so it's like, it's like, it's like being a fish and trying to understand what's water. <laughs> you, you know, I mean, you're in the midst of it. And, and we, we take the assumptions of our culture into our being, we're patterned by them before we are old enough to formulate a question. And so I'm, I, I raged against that. Now, in ways that were quite unpleasant at times, I mean, you know, someone would say to me, how are you? And I would say, well, now what exactly do you mean by that question? You mean, how is it that I am? Is that what you're getting at? Is this, is this an ontological inquiry? Because, you know, it's just this pattern of speech. And it reminds me that um, Archilochus has this marvelous poem. Because um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a young, you know, you know kind of um, uh, teenager coming into manhood, I, I sort of imagined what would take me down would be a tiger in the night, right? Now, here's Archilochus, a mar mercenary soldier, the first lyric poet in the tradition of, of the West. And he wrote this poem, What breaks me, young friend, is tasteless desire, oh. dead iambics, <laughs> boring dinners. Oh, my God. And, that, you know, that sums it. I mean, dead iambics, dead patterns of speech, tasteless desire. That's, that's what I was surrounded by. And I had the sense that the, you know, from... from a fairly young age, that the adults around me were living out a fantasy and were gently saying, come join us. You, you, you'll, you'll fit right in. And you, this this will this will suit you well. You can succeed at that. And my, my very being rankled at that. And so and so I um I left to save my life. And that leaving reminds me of that Kabir poem about about you either plunge into the flames and and cross through safely or you waver and are scorched but you didn't leave before you had one of the great experiences of your life and that was at the age of 17 when you went to see your first no play 
you told me about it last night and the whole of my body tingled because I knew that that must have been a moment of revolution for you. Can you share that with me? I, it, 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 it was a moment of revelatory revolution. Um, so I'd, 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 I was involved with the theater company downtown uh, and, and, and which was edgy because I was, you know, I joined it when I was 16. My God. And everyone else was in their mid 20s and, and much, much older. And so I'm thrust into this environment and hungry for it and um, loved theater and was reading everything and came across treatises by Zayami Motokio, oh. the founder of No Theater. And these are exquisite. And I mean, there, you know, as a, as a, as a 16 year old, when I first discovered these, in three pages, he said virtually everything that could or needed to be said about art. Right. And I heard um, that a no play was coming to Montreal, which was like a six hour Greyhound bus ride away. So I, I bought my ticket to this wow. no play and got on the Greyhound bus, didn't know where I was going to stay, didn't know anyone in Montreal. And, and uh, there was, I remember this building, it said, you know, um, Beds, $1.25 a night. I said, that's me. It's exactly my budget. So I went up and there's this big room with all these cots and these like men lying on these cots and coughing all night long. And uh, anyway, it was a fabulous. Perfect play. <laughs> Perfect. And um, saw the no play the next day and I dissolved in tears. I, I was shaken to my core. It was, I had... It was it was this power held within this restrained beauty, and I. There were two things. There was one was the emotional impact on me that that shook my life forever. The other was what just happened, because I could parse theater, and by 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 the age of this was seven, I was seventeen, and I'd seen Gilgit on stage, and I'd seen. Richardson on stage, wow. um, and and here and I could I could appreciate the I, I could appreciate and understand to some extent the craft in no that it that it had been like an avalanche through my soul I had no idea and the reason <laughs> I had no idea I found out later because of the Japanese concept of hara. Yes. So hara, the belly in the Japanese culture, is the source of one's profoundest truth. And I had never, until that moment in Montreal, I'd never seen an arm lift from that deep, deep knowing. I'd never seen a head turn and see from that place. So I had no way of understanding its effect on me. What do you think is the difference between the great Western actors that you had loved and the actors that you saw doing now at that moment, where do Western actors tend to act from? You know, the great Western actors and the great no actors have, have in a way found, both found their way to the same place of clarity and play and available aliveness. Now, within the no tradition that's been found within in this austere form, um, you know, the 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 every footfall, every syllable has been laid down for six hundred years. This is how it's done. Within that constraint is the freedom to see and the freedom of being. And the Japanese culture itself is so grounded in the body. So one of the primary differences between Western theater and Eastern theater, in Western theater, what matters is what's happening from the waist up. There's, there's this and the voice and the face and, yes. and the legs. They move you to the chair. They move you to the mantle to pick up the dress. The, the, the legs are prosthetics yes. within our culture. And in, in Japanese theater, and, and it, it's so powerful in no... Everything that matters courses through the legs, every stamp of the foot, every turn of the body. That's, that's the gravitational center of the performance. I think there may be just two exceptions in Western acting that I've seen. I think Richardson was an exception, Ralph Richardson, because there was something completely eerie 
about yeah. how he said and moved. You had no sense of where he was going. And every performance he ever gave was completely different. He was improvising with the whole of his being in a sometimes dotty way, but infinitely moving. And the other one that I think really achieved that at times is Brando. Mm -hmm. I think Brando was acting from his gut, from yeah. his groin, with the whole force of that beautiful, tormented body behind what he did. But for the majority of actors, it's has been like that. And both of those, I mean, you know, Richardson had his dottiness. Brando had this unpredictable energy that yes. you, right and both of the irrationality yes is rooted yes. In, in that different sort of knowing of the body what happened after you had that experience is that you did leave home and you undertook this absolutely crazy two-year cycle journey across the world and ended up in japan the source of all things in many ways in your life so Please give us a sense of what that was about. Well, yeah, the two of them came together. The, the, the need to break free, um, to jump out of the water and into a different medium. To jump out of the West, too. To jump out of the West. Into the East, because Absolutely. you glimpsed the, what the East could give you, this completely different understanding yeah, yeah. of the human self, grounded in a more transcendent approach, but also rooted in the body in a mysterious way. Yeah, and, and, you know, I'd been accepted to study physics at Trinity College at U of T, and I loved physics. And then here was this, this mystery of no theater, and ultimately, when it came down to it, the mystery of no theater was more compelling to me than the mystery of quantum mechanics. And, and so, you know, it was, it, was, it was like this fork in the road, and I had this choice to make, my, you know, Am I going to go to university or should I, you know, at, at the age of 18 now, should sure. I go to England and buy a bicycle and head off for Japan? Obviously. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there was, you know, there was no plan. There was no roadmap. And I had, you know, the, I mean, you know, I, the reason of an 18 year old says, well, if you, if you have a bike and you get on it and you start pedaling and you don't stop pedaling, and you're headed in the right direction, you'll get to Japan. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually. And, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. And, and um, on a bicycle, you are so available to the world around you. You see everyone. They see you. You're in the same space, Absolutely. unlike in a car. Um, and I slept outside every night. And I didn't sleep in a tent because when you're in a tent, Everyone knows where you are, and you don't know where anyone else is. So, you know, I had my, my air mattress I'd blow up in my sleeping bag, and I had a plastic sheet I'd pull over me if the rain started falling, and I attuned. And there's this thing that happened. You know, I'm, 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 I never know what's around the next corner. I'm making my way through Europe and the Middle East and India, wow. and the, the sun is beginning to set, and it's just about time to start looking for a place to sleep. And... And there was a guidance available every night. And I would just follow that guidance. I would feel my way forward, guided to a place where I could safely spend the night every single night. Every I was just speaking. Night. I feel that that trip gave you what characterizes the work that you've done. It gave you that sense that there's always another place to arrive at. It gave you the sense of you have to stay out in the open, as Kabir yeah. says, and expose yourself to everything. And it will take you around bends you didn't know existed to places you couldn't imagine. And that's so much the truth of the exploration of embodiment, isn't it? Yeah, and the, and the trust the trust. That underlies that, because without the trust, you go up to here, right? And and that trust... And without the abandon yeah. to the present, you go up to here, because you are terrified of what may be around that next bend. Yeah. So you learned that then. You learned that through this amazing journey. And that, and that you know, the connection between the body's attunement and this field of the present and, and the... the, the um, 
mutual exchange yes. that happens, the guidance. The lovemaking. The, yes. What yes. happened to you in Japan when you got there? What was Japan for you? What is Japan for you? Japan, more than anything, was no theater to me. Um, the, the culture uh, I learned so much from it. I learned, you know, just to say it, on, on the bike, I, I went through so many different cultures, so many different ways of being. Um, and, and Japan, um, there is a patience, there is a willingness to go to an embodied knowing. Um, there is an aesthetic that ravishes me. And there is that, that embodied, exquisite world of no theater. You know, the, the no theater standing on a stage. It's like, uh, you know, it's, it's like the theater is a violin. And the no the, the no actor is is playing on the stage, and the whole of the violin, the whole of the theater, trembles to every gesture, to every footfall. So it's a, it's 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 a deep, deep experience of wholeness, ultimately. That was there as a as a model. Um, it was established as a as a possibility for me at a very early age as in a way that was a, a counterpoise to the West. So, so the, you know, I, 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 sp I spent the whole of my life as an actor and no was always the touchstone for me of, uh, of, of embodied truth. And the West was, has this energy and, and um, its own ecstasy to it. And I was, I was strung between those in a most fruitful way, you know, bringing those together. So you were bringing together the ecstatic energy of the West with this controlled, classical, hierarchical, stark, pure, ascetic energy that had been purified by centuries of profound culture, yeah. of the strangest culture in the world, really, yeah. the culture of Japan. And those two things started to work on you alchemically in the years that unfolded. Yeah, so as I tried to understand Western theater in these other terms, you know, I, I eventually developed a workshop for actors that was was so different from what else was around um, because it's it's you know then what does it mean to be fully embodied and fully receptive to the moment because you know western acting so easily moves into how to present and you know the the whole process of an actor of breaking down the line in the subtext and the sub subtext and, right. and all that which is which you know has value but ultimately, ultimately, your receptivity to this living moment is what will bring you to life. Right. And there are two real main approaches in Western theatre. There's that approach that you describe, but there's also the, I must feel as the character, I must be this woman who's been raped, or I must be Hamlet. And that's also... A very powerful approach, but it has limitations because it doesn't have the impersonal personality of that utter responsiveness to the present that you see in No. There's a mystery in No, which both of those two approaches in Western theatre doesn't begin to begin to touch. Yeah. And that's what you were trying to bring in in the workshops. Yeah, and that, you know, what you're speaking to there... Um, I'm talking about Stanislav. Yeah, yeah, the, the methods, yes. uh, all that stuff. And so, it's glorious stuff. Fabulous. But it doesn't have that. No, and, and the, the risk for the actor um, coming through that system is that you, you are encouraged in subtle ways to put your attention on the emotion. Right. Now, if you put your attention on the emotion, you are denaturing 
the emotion. Right. To me, an emotion is like a lens that pulls some aspect right. of the world into focus. Right. Love does it's that. An Anger does that. Of yeah. all of the different f events around you. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's so. So then, to you know, if if emotion is a is magnet, a magnet or a lens, I think of it as a right. as a lens. You see that with love, and the love is the the lens that that pulls it into focus. Right. If you're putting your focus on the lens it's like looking at the finger that's pointing to the moon right. and i think i think western theater becomes self conscious and self centered Absolutely. under that influence it becomes narcissistic in the deepest and sometimes richest sense but it never in my experience attains what no theater does or kathakali dance does or those kathakali dramas that are enacted in india it never achieves that mysterious interplay between profound personality and profound impersonality that mystery of that dance of opposites so there so in no theater when the the height of a no play um the actor the main actor stops singing and the chorus takes over his lines and he enters a dance and when it's when it's happening exquisitely there's a there's a saying in Japan that it was as though the actor were being danced by the chorus and that's where the mystery comes in and it's you know that just tends not to happen in western theater the actor tends to remain in charge in a different way do you think it happened in greek theater i suspect that when you read the tragedies of Aeschylus, for example, so much of the emotional and philosophical weight of it's carried by the chorus. And I imagine there was a kind of acting then, which was more primordial, more grounded, that could have expressed that. I, yeah, and, and the very, you know, uh, it, it, you know the, the Greek amphitheater, the, the Dionysian rites, it began in this relationship to the gods. Right. And so being moved by other you know, being available to right. other, you, I, I, I just imagine that's that is it sort of posits the very ground of your performance. Right. How do you allow other to pass through you in that way? When you started to do these workshops and started to try and bring the Western energy and the classicism of presence of the No together, did that begin a wholly new period of spiritual awakening for you? Did your spiritual awakening then follow on from that, or did it come separately from that, or was it interrelated to that? I've, I've, since I was a child, I felt the present as a presence. Mm. I feel known by it. I feel it as a thou that I can speak to uh, intimately. And so, and so what happened as my, as my uh, workshops developed, I was articulating that for myself on behalf of others in a way, right? right. That, that heightened and clarified right. the experience. And then the same thing happened with the writing. I mean, I, I spent 10 years writing and rewriting new self new world and i was i was writing that relationship into clarity for myself right. it was it was a learning curve that i needed to take myself on one of the things that's so moving to me about new self new world is that there is really no book like it because what you are able to express it's not simply the amazing information that came to you through this process. And there is absolutely crucial and amazing information in New Self, New World. Information about the relationship between the brain and the head and the brain and the belly. Information between of the relationship between the male and the female aspects of the psyche reflected to the depths of the body. Information about how exactly it feels at the deepest, richest, most poetic sense to become increasingly embodied. That would be wonderful enough, and that would make the book wonderful enough. But what is truly amazing about the book is that it's able to guide the reader through your 
very delicate and expansive prose through the actual process of discovery that you yourself made and guide the reader into the understanding that this discovery never ends. It is an ever expanding field of awakening. One of the great mistakes that some of the teachers of embodiment are making is to say that the process ends, that once you're grounded and embodied, that's it. Are you kidding? That's just the beginning of another infinitely mysterious journey, which is beginning for all of us in this amazing time, that is the time of the birth of a new divine humanity. And one of the crucial contributions of your work is that through your great poetic gift and through your abandon to continual exploration, you've been able not only to give us much of the crucial information, but also you've been able to transmit the way to approach this information, the way to integrate it, the way to allow it to continually invite us into an ever-deepening knowing, an ever-deepening grounding, an ever more expanding sense of an ever-expanding understanding of wholeness. My, that's wonderful. My, my hope with the prose is that the prose will be sufficiently embodied to speak to the reader's body, even when the reader's not necessarily aware of that, but the, the rhythms that move through the prose are the rhythms of my body. And those rhythms that that coursing flow is 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 what is most important in my writing um you know the concatenation of ideas um can be this can be that but if that life isn't there if those it. ideas aren't riding that life and and being illuminated by that life and supported by it then the then the prose is dead and then what's it saying? Who are the prose writers that most impassioned you on your journey? Who would you say were your masters? Gosh, so many. Um, Select two that you really love. Um, you know, I, I have to mention Zayami. Yeah. Because, because he... There's nothing like Zayami. No. Honed by Zen Buddhism to diamond point, and yet so oh. mysterious and so infinitely powerful. And and and, you know, the simplicity of a metaphor that illumines the universe. Um, you know, he when he writes about the nine stages that an actor goes through, each each is a metaphor. Like like this stage is like snow piled in a silver bowl. I mean. Whoa, you know, so so that potency, um, snow piled in a silver bowl, that can expand endlessly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so so Zandi had a, a really profound um, impact on me. Um, um, I have to say, your book um, that I came across the book, uh, Tibetan Book of Living and Dying, um, um, scorched me in, in wonderful ways. Um, and there was, a, th there was a sort of kinship between that and Thomas Merton. Um, there, was, uh, um, there was something about Merton's writing that was similarly embodied, embodied uncompromising, and and highly attuned to an aesthetic that honors life. Thank you for saying that, because I didn't write that book, but it was written through me and Patrick Gaffney with Sogiel, so that it was a very strange trinity, and I did a lot of the honing and the writing, but Patrick also did, and Sogiel gave us this immense yeah. transmission from the heart of the Tibetan tradition, and the combination of all of us working on it produced this manuscript, which really does circle around all the major themes of awakening in a way that can, I think, 
initiate people not just into the information but into how that initiation yeah. irradiates heart mind soul and body so i'm thrilled that you picked that up yeah oh and it just i it, it, you know it shook my being thank you yeah yeah thank you when you look now at new self new world and you look at the way in which it has been received by many of the leading pioneers of embodiment as really a classic text. I refer to it constantly. I read it and reread it constantly to tune myself. I speak about it with my pupils whenever I can. What do you think the three most important things that you could possibly say about New Self, New World would be? What are the three most important aspects of that vision that you'd like to people to really start to savor and appreciate and integrate so, uh, to me the foremost is there is this thing in the history of our consciousness that that is is rarely addressed um we think of consciousness as as being this field, and you you look being in the head, being in the head. The consciousness is really the tyrant in the head, the tyrant of the rational mind, yeah, the clear intellect. And of course, consciousness is in that. Right. That's where the brain is. Where else right. would it be? But you go back to the early Neolithic, you go back to the Paleolithic, and you you come to understand that we experience the center of our awareness in the belly, in the pelvic bowl. Yes. And you see that in the art, and you see that even... Um, yes. Um, Gimbo, That's the horror of the Japanese. That's yeah. That's moved you in no. Yes. And Gimbotash writes about, about the navel stone, and you, you know it, it, it upends our assumptions, because when we bury someone, there is a headstone, and of course there's a headstone right. marking the most important place of the yes. person and in if she's discovered um neolithic sites where there is a navel stone that is marking the center of being so so once you understand that then you can understand why that center rose up through the body because we started to take control of our world that's it and that intelligence in the head is is the male pole of our consciousness it's how i experience it and it's systematic and it analyzes and it stands back from the world in a way that gives us perspective and it's glorious and i love it but it can easily become addicted to domination and power and has become psychotic now, which is why our addiction to being ruled by the mind in the head is part of why we're destroying the planet. Yes, and yes. we don't understand the relationship with the body. So we're trying to outthink our problems. We're trying to use well, that more faculty. than not understanding the relationship to, with the body, we despise the body, hate the body, find it disgusting, find it inconvenient to this luminous, clear, detached, dissociated mind intelligence. That too. I <laughs> just I mean the whole history it's is, so sick. is fraught. And 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 specifically then what we have demeaned is that realm of our consciousness that is our the female pole of our consciousness right. and then when you understand that and then you look at our history and you see how you know as as we took control through the neolithic revolution of the world around us and our center rose we left the mother because our culture was macrofocal, right. gathered around the mother and moved to the father we became patriarchal right. we left the earth and we suddenly our gods are in the sky and that whole that whole journey up and now we're stuck in right. this realm and we are specifically stuck in a realm that is at a distance from the world so so the strength of that intelligence in the head is that it can gain perspective and power and power and and i mean perspective enables power it enables you to manipulate and but 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 the very fact that the head is at a distance means if you live in the head, you will live alienated from the world around you. There is no other way that that can, that can play out. And what's the second great aspect of your book is that it's not only that we have become dissociated through this 
psychotic addiction to the head intelligence. It's that the cutting off from the female brain in the belly cuts us off from our essential compassion nature, our essential love nature. So we get to the place where we've created a system through this head intelligence which treats human beings as disposable, treats nature as disposable, treats life as disposable, and has created the final devastating masterpiece of a death machine that is now systematically destroying everything. This is terrifying. But the beauty of the second theme in your work is that we are not stuck here finally. We can get in touch with the female brain that is a scientific discovery, which is the enteric intelligence of this part of the body. The horror isn't something that a few mystics invented. The horror is something that mystics knew was alive with intelligence, and science has confirmed this in the last hundred years. Can you explore that amazing yeah. vision for us? Yeah, I mean, what's, what's interesting to me is that the neurology, the physiology of that brain in the belly was discovered and forgotten. Yes. Discovered. It was too forgotten. radical a discovery. It was too There's revolutionary. Like they couldn't any, get to... any culture ultimately is a story that communicates what it means to be human. And there is no place in our cultural story of what it means to be human for a brain in the belly. And so science, you know, the science was there. Byron Robinson published a book in 1910 right. called The Abdominal and Pelvic Brain. He drew the anatomy of it, and it's forgotten. Johannes Langley discovered, you know, the three, the three parts of the autonomic nervous system, the, the sympathetic, the parasympathetic, and the enteric. Right. The enteric is that, is that brain in the belly. And to this day... They've forgotten the third part, and they say there are two parts to the auto right. autonomic nervous system. I mean, he wrote the classic book, and there's this whole aspect of it that is it is in this cloud of neglect because we can't face it. And so the you know the science is is only beginning. I I, I look forward to the day when the research that's been applied to the heart by the Heart Math Institute... Right, will be applied to the brain that, and the belly. Yes. But it seems to me the same thing has happened in the great revolution in quantum physics, which has taken science to this paradoxical place where it's meeting the deepest conclusions of mysticism. And yet this new science, magnificent though it is, has not yet penetrated the scientific fundamentalism of the culture. Similarly, the discovery of this female brain it, as you describe it, and as these great scientists have, hasn't yet challenged ordinary scientists to go the next step. It's available for them, but there's a cultural, psychic, spiritual block, which we'll have to pray gets eliminated, gets dissolved, so that the enormous intelligence of science can be trained on this to wake up our knowledge of it. Yeah, there's just not not the intra I mean, why would they bring those questions to bear on a, a brain that's about digestion? <laughs> why? Because some of yeah. them might wake up to the fact that scientific fundamentalism is one of the fundamentalisms that is destroying our planet. Yeah. Some of them might wake up to the fact that be, by being addicted to a system that they claim is absolute truth, they are contributing to the death of the world. And that by opening to the mystery that is this female brain, because the conclusions are endlessly expanding from that place, they may themselves be humbled into a far richer, far deeper, far clearer, far more helpful vision of science. And if they, you see, if they had the experience that their scientific training prohibits that th yes then the questions would surface but we they they are um sort of the exemplars of a culture that is so dedicated to living in the head that our economic system is capitalism 
which translates as headism because it, the, the yeah. etymology of yeah, it is the head is, yeah, yeah. exactly right. and and you you know you strive to become the ceo of a company right. and chief is a word that comes from the latin word right. for head right. and the captain of a football team every leader in our culture we we call the head any leader of any hierarchy of any organization is the head of that organization we we cannot culturally imagine what it is to be led by an intelligence other than that that isolated analyzing enclosed intelligence of the cranium but you and i know that so many people now are starving for a larger vision and those are the people who thank god we meet and we try and help because of our own journey into this expanded awareness, this embodied divine human awareness. People know they're stuck in the head and they don't know what to do about it. And they don't have the tools. And that's, you know, that's the, the privilege I've had in my life of discovering really, um, really simple, practical ways of landing in the body so i you know there's a lot of before we get to the practical yeah. tools i want to go to the third point because this is to me really important and i love this what really moves me in your work is that you know everything about the horrible tyranny of the head and you've explored a great deal about this glorious expansive subtle profoundly grand rooted divine human intelligence that's in the female brain but you're not advocating a return to the past you're not advocating a going back to a merely matrim matrifocal world you're really the pioneer as i hope i am of a sacred marriage between a humbled illumined embodied mind and this male mind and this female mind to produce something new something amazing which we haven't seen before we and we haven't seen it because in in the evolution of our consciousness our our conscious center has been localized it was localized in the belly it was localized in homer's day in the chest right so homer uses this word right. green over and over right. it means mind and diaphragm and it's been localized in the head and and in my personal experience and and to the best of my understanding you know what i hope is that we are moving towards a sense of of this pole of consciousness that runs through the body yes. like a bar magnet yes. with its north yes. pole and its south pole and it sustains a field yes. around it that is part of the field of intelligence in which we all live i feel it like a kind of golden column of, that comes up right from the bottom chakra right up yeah, yeah. the heart all of the centers and goes up and goes right down to the center of the earth, the sun in the earth and the sun above. And the, the key for me is the opening of the heart center, because that to me is the marriage bed in which the male brain and the female brain make love. And all of the intelligence of the female brain hidden in the depths of the body, and all of the grand intelligence of the male brain in the head, they can sink together into this expansive, spacious, strange, mysterious, pulsing power that is the heart and unite in ever more mysterious and expanding ways there. That's been my living experience. That's how I experienced it. It's been my gateway into it. But in Mine is slightly different. So that's only what I yeah, know yeah, yeah. now. No, I don't know anything. And I don't really. think there's a right or a wrong. Right. I, I'm willing to go in. Yeah. <laughs> so in my experience, the, the gifts of the male intelligence travel down through my body and are reborn. In the hara. In the hara. I get it. And, yes. and, what, and the heart, to me, my, my heart feels like the portal through which my wholeness meets the world's wholeness. Oh, I love that. And so the so, child is born here yes. and peeps out and dances out of the heart center. And, and the That's heart, beautiful. the heart, I mean, we... That may be much more accurate. But, 
we we know in our culture the heart is important right. and we are trying to go from the head to the heart right. and it leaves the heart unsupported its roots are in the right. in our being I love and that. it's like trying to open a flower and you've cut off the yes. stalk so, and 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 the heart when that marriage for me happens in the pelvic no, bowl I, I, the I heart that. just Opens that and opens and yeah, and it's like a fountain that rises right from the from the pelvic bowl. Yeah, and the marriage takes place here, and then expands through the heart as ever radiant yeah. compassion. I yeah. love that. Thank you. Yeah, and let's end with what you were saying before I asked you to go on this journey. Was that the beauty of the work that you've done since I know you? You, I've known you now for nine years, I think, is that not only have you been able to get out these two extraordinary books, you've been doing workshops all over the world, and you've been training people to do this work in their own unique ways. But you've also evolved some completely original, stunning techniques, a whole sacred technology, if you like, mm -hmm. of how to experience this birthing in the horror of the union of the female and male brains and really experience it beyond concept, beyond thought. Yeah. How has this been and how have you yourself found these techniques? What, is, what has been the way in which you discovered these wonderful technologies? The, the technologies are just articulations of my experience. Right. So I feel something, and oh, what was that? And it comes into form in a way that that avails a path that others might follow. And that's been what I've been up to too. It, it has yes, to come yeah, from yeah. going into the unknown yourself, yeah, and then being very attentive and baffled for a long time and confused, and then oh, images come. You're guided, and then suddenly something is alive and clear yeah it's amazing isn't and it? and there is there is a a geography to the body's intelligence it's like exploring a cave yes and and you know there is this landing place to land in the body for me is to land on the pelvic floor yes. is to most specifically to land on the perineum and when i land on the perineum I enter a place of wholeness, a place of non-personal intimacy, a place that resonates to the world around me and is informed through that resonance. And in the, you know, in the, I, the weekend workshop is sort of the core vehicle um, through which I help people. And there are four themes that the weekend workshop moves through. And the, the first is breath. And we deprive the body of breath oh. by managing it. Never breathing <clears throat> deeply down into the heart. Most people breathe from here. And, it's and taken me years to get to even begin to breathe from down there. And we are such a, a top-down culture that we turn breathing into a top-down practice. Right. So we actually imagine pushing the breath down into the body, which takes muscles, and the muscles get tired, and the breath goes shallow again. And, and, and to find that you can release the body to the breath. The, the breath isn't muscled into the body. The body releases to it, and that is initiated in the pelvic floor. But it requires total relaxation of tension, doesn't it? Well, here's the thing. The out-breath, on the out-breath, the pelvic floor engages to support the out-breath. Yes. And then releases. Yes. And then it releases down and engages to support the in-breath. Yes. And releases. Yes. So as the pelvic floor releases to the breath, there's this subtle invitation to the whole of the body to release with yes. it, which is lovely. So the first theme is breath, and that sort of awakens the sensitivity of the pelvic bone. Yes. The second theme is rest. Yes. Well, there's this whole... <laughs> Who there's this, thought of that? Yes. Yeah, there's this whole cultural value system yes. that tells us up is good 
and down is bad. And that's part of our demeaning of the female. Yes. And, and the exhortation. And the demeaning of sexuality and the whole yeah. body in general. And yes. the exhortation to, you know, raise your consciousness um, is, is potentially damaging in our culture because you're addressing people who couldn't get much higher you without lower leaving. your consciousness. That's what I'm saying. That's the whole, <laughs> raising your consciousness, that's the problem. You've yeah. got to get it, help it arise from where it actually really arises. To al so to allow the body's energy to come to rest on the soles of the feet, to allow the right. center of your awareness to come to rest on the perineum, is, you know, once that sensitivity is awakened, that place of rest becomes available. And and that's the landing place in the body. If you want embodiment, that's where you come to rest. And it's not rest in, as opposed to activity. It's rest in activity. Yeah. If you see, the Dalai Lama is definitely in that state because he's tireless because he's never exhausting himself. He's never using up this energy it comes always arises from this marriage and the hara yeah yeah and we're we're in a culture where where doing disconnects from being right and 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 tries to go it alone and and when you find that marriage with being right. everything you do is empowered by being it's and you do so much more so much more effectively yeah. because it's irradiated by the subtle wisdom of being so it's do be do be do be do not do or be is it and it's not and it's not uh doing that is governed by idea it's doing that unfolds responsively within right. the conditions of the present and this is the essence of what i'm trying to communicate in sacred activism because it's a new kind of activism on every level is yeah. born from this experience of the marriage of the male and female brain because it's not only that that gives you a deeper and richer source of energy it actually gives you a far more alert sensitivity to what is necessary and what is possible in any given situation. So you move with the responsive intelligence of life itself instead of being governed by either your ideals or your vision of what needs to be done. And then life itself can move through you using the whole of you to transform the situation much, much more powerfully. In the there, there is a finding that has established that the conscious mind is aware of about one, one millionth of what the body is aware <laughs> one of. One millionth. And that's what's running the show. That's it. And it's running the show of most of most activists, which is why that activism facing a situation as vastly difficult as ours is not going to work. Yes. The only thing that could possibly work is a divinely embodied human intelligence that is infinitely responsive to the demands of each situation as it arises. Yeah. This is the real awakening. It's that attunement that will carry us forward. And we don't know where it's going. We couldn't know yeah. where it's going. Anybody yeah. who thinks that they know where it's going doesn't know anything about it. Yeah. And I don't know whether this is your experience of this, but it's certainly been mine, and I suspect it is your experience of it. The more I know, the more I know that I don't know, and the more I know that any attempt to crystallize anything I know is a subtle defeat, because this intelligence is infinite and infinitely expanding. It's nothing less than the intelligence of the embodied divine. So to think that we will ever get to the end of this is idiotic. And that entails a complete reimagining of what enlightenment is, yeah. a complete reimagining of goals and ends, and a commitment to the most radical and amused and profoundly self-amused humility. Because if you don't cling to that, you will be easily lost in this ever-expanding forest of awareness. You will get trapped in your own subtle desire for power. And this intelligence will have nothing to do with you. 
and and uh, you Do know, you agree with me? Yeah, enlightenment. You know, it go, goes back to the passage for me that you read at the beginning about presence and self knowledge. Right. To me, the present is enlightened. Totally. If you join the present, you partake of that enlightenment. But it's not something you achieve. It's not no. something you possess. It's not something. Yeah, it's 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 found in humility, as you say. Well, it's it's found and lost in moment by moment because yeah. it as. I asked the Dalai Lama what enlightenment was one, and he laughed and laughed and laughed. He said, enlightenment is being responsive to this moment. And you can be enlightened one moment, and as soon as you yeah. get angry or uh, for unnecessary reasons or jealous, or bit, you lose it. That's so you, it's a constant tuning is what yeah. enlightenment is. Yeah. And the only way you can constantly tune is by staying very very vigilant and very restful and deeply peaceful and deeply dynamic, but responsive from this full-bodied, full-hearted, full-souled intelligence. And, I, and I, th I think of that intelligence, I think of the body as a bell that resonates to the field, that everything that passes through the field passes through that bell and it is resonating. And the more spaciousness there is within that body, that resonator, the more clearly you attune and find that moment-by-moment -moment guidance. It's the only way, Philip. Yeah. We can't possibly do it until we're being done by it. Right? It, I, I, there's no separation. No separation. But yeah. And so to follow these themes of the workshop, there's the theme of breath, breath which sensitizes the pelvic floor, the pelvic bowl. The theme of rest, where you land there in that sensitivity. The third theme is receptivity. Mm. So once you've landed there, you can receive the world into the pelvic bowl. You can feel the sights of the world there. You can feel the sounds of the world there. You can feel the resonance of the presence there. And once you're receiving into the pelvic bowl, you are integrating. And integration is the fourth theme. Because that that intelligence, the genius of that intelligence in the pelvic bowl is the genius of integration. When you say it's so easy to be trapped by language and you're so rarely trapped by language, because I don't believe you do the process of integration. It's not that you are integrating. It's integration happens, doesn't it? So, so, How is, so am I making... Yeah, so let me, let me clarify. I appreciate that. To me, integration is when something that is held apart, separate from your being, comes in contact with your being. Right. So my image for that is a murmuration of starlings, <laughs> which I would gorgeous, this, you know, this cloud right. that, that wafts and How do and, they do that? Yeah, How now, is it done? Yes. Imagine a, a, a lone starling. Right. That joins the murmuration. Right. So the movement of that starling informs the whole of the murmuration and the murmuration harmonizes right. the movement of that star. The field yeah. adjusts immediately, yes. doesn't it? So as I integrate with my being, that's what I feel happening, whether it's an unintegrated idea or an unintegrated right. emotion or right. whatever, it is it is it is informing the you know, the whole, as the whole is harmonizing it. Oh, that's so beautiful. Now, that's so beautiful. But it also obtains to what you're saying, because, because what is my being? Right. Well, my being is what I discover when I'm fully present. Right. So it's not, you know, it's not self-integration in right. that way. It is that larger process. It is, yes. In a sense, you begin to understand beyond thought and concept that you are just one way of experiencing that the whole has created to enjoy itself and all of that whole is through some unimaginable magical miracle present to you at all moments in you as you and if you lose connection with that you lose everything but if you stay humbly in connection with that it will reveal ever and ever and ever. And I, th I thrive on the clarity that, that that submission enables. 
There is nothing that can replace it. There's no substitute. And on that note, my friends, let's just not end this conversation, but <laughs> temporarily suspend it. Thank you. Thank you, dear Philip. Thank so, you, so wonderful. Please read Philip's books. Don't just read his books. Take them into your heart. Savor them. Read them slowly. Because the words himself, as you have heard from the way he speaks, they carry a transmission beyond words. And they will help you as they've helped me and continue to help me try and end the tyranny of the mind and try and marry the female and male brain inside myself to give birth to this new divine human that's trying to be born through this crisis everywhere. So, thank you. <laughs>